again. So, um, in the uh, the spiritual disciplines that we've been talking about, um, this one was a tricky one because it's one that a lot of people don't like to talk about, and it's one that a lot of people have bad experiences with it. And so we're like, you know what? We're we're going to get a guest speaker to come in and talk about confession. Um, but in reality, this is not just a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual discipline that has been pretty universal in Christian history um, from the earliest days of Christianity. And when you read the, the spiritual fathers and the spiritual mothers, everyone talks about some version of this. Um, and so it's, I think it's impossible to have a Christian spiritual life without some form of confession in our lives. And so we are, we are so, so thrilled. Um, joining us tonight is Lori Anderson. So you have seen her before. She came in our prayer series, so I went from the book of prayer. She is at Chapelwood and works with the Center for Christian Spirituality. Don't you? I no. have um, transitioned from my staff role, and so okay. I worship you it. Worship there. I worship there, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but she uh, she could speak on a lot of different topics, and I think she's going to do amazing at this one. And so, uh, without further ado, Lori Anderson. Thank you. All right, I brought my Mary Poppins bag over here, so it'll take me just a second to get us a little situated. I brought some visual cues for us. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It is wonderful to be in the room together. I hope y'all can hear me okay in the back. I know sometimes my voice doesn't carry as far as I would like it to. Thank you. All right. Well, um, as, as Meredith said, um, we've been in lots of different places today. We've uh, encountered a lot of people. We've run our errands. We've been at work. We may have been transporting kids. Uh, we may have been at a po important appointments. So let's just take a few breaths and really allow ourselves to arrive in this room. And we get to allow ourselves to arrive in the company of others. And most importantly, we become aware of God who has come before us and has anticipated our arrival. Lord, we offer you the gift of this time and this place. We come with grateful hearts. <clears throat> and we ask that your spirit be our unseen guest this evening. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Confession and journaling. I think it's um, going to be a very fruitful pairing for us. I thought we would start with, it looks like it's going to be on your last page. I've got Psalm 51. And floating around is a prayer book called Psalms for Praying by Nan, Nan Merrill. And that's where this, um, where this version of Psalm 51 comes from. And this is our classic psalm for confession. You can see here that there's some regular print and then there's some bold print. And so what I would love to do is for us to offer this together and I'll read the regular print parts and then you can read the bolded print parts and we'll offer this together. Have mercy on me, O gracious one, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant kindness, forgive me where my thoughts and deeds have hurt others. Lead me in the paths of justice. Guide my steps on the paths of peace. Teach me that I may know my weaknesses, the shortcomings that bind me, the unloving ways that separate me, that keep me from recognizing your life in me. For I keep company with fear and dwell in the house of ignorance. 
yet mm. I was brought forth in love, and love is my birthright. You, you have placed your truth in my inner being, therefore teach me the wisdom of the heart. Forgive all that binds me in fear, that I might radiate love. Cleanse me, that your light might shine in me. Fill me with gladness, help me to transform weakness into strength. Look not on my past <laughs> mistakes, but on the aspirations of my heart. Create in me a clean heart, O gracious one, and put a new and right spirit within me. Enfold me in the arms of love and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Restore in me the joy of your saving grace and encourage me with a new spirit. Then I will teach others your ways and prisoners of fear will return to you. Deliver me from the conditions of society, most gracious one. O oh, keep me from temptations that I may tell of your justice and mercy. O oh, gracious one, open my lips, and my mouth shall sing forth your praise. For you do not want sacrifice. You delight in our friendship with you. A sacrifice most appropriate is a humble spirit, a repentant and contrite heart. O oh, merciful one, is the gift you most desire. Let the nations turn from war and encourage one another as good neighbors. O oh, most gracious and compassionate friend, melt our hearts of stone, break through the fears that lead us into darkness, and guide our steps into the way of peace. Amen. All right. It is, I mean, it's so good to, to read and offer and pray psalms together. Um, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to retreat at a Benedictine monastery in New Mexico. And one of the things that's very striking to me is that they observe in this particular monastery, they observe four times of prayer every day. And so when we're on retreat, we join them and they pray the Psalms four times a day. And they've been at this monastery, they've been doing that for 60 years. And it does my heart so good to know that right now there's a group of monks in New Mexico. It's probably very close to their Vesper service, and they're going to be doing the exact same thing that we're doing right now, praying psalms together. And it does good for my heart also to know that whatever chaos is going on in the world, whatever headlines I'm reading that day, in the midst of that, there are people praying every day on behalf of our world. And so there's both the headlines and there's what's happening in this little monastery in New Mexico. And I wanted to bring that to y'all this evening. Now this psalm right here, for instance, if you were going to carry this psalm into your personal confession, into your personal journal journaling, one one way that you might want to work with this is I bet as you were reading tonight there was probably one line, one verse, one phrase, one image that really like oh that one. <laughs> you know, it just seemed to shine a little brighter. So one thing that um one thing that you might want to do at home in your journal is say, let's see. I'm going to say that for me really created me a clean heart. That always that often rings true to me. So what I might do at home is I may say at the top of my page, Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart. And then I may just go from there. And I may allow that to become my prayer. I may explore that in some ways in my journal. And so it's sort of a way to take this Psalm, personalize it to what's going on in your real everyday life, and then to go and just go another level, take another step and allow that psalm to shape your prayer. So thank you for, um, for the beginning, <coughs> for beginning that way tonight. All right, back up at the top of your, at the very top of your handout, you've got, um, we've got an icon. This is 
Abba Menos and Jesus from 8th century Egypt. Abba Menos is uh, in the Desert Fathers, is one of the Desert Fathers. And I brought this to you tonight because one of the things that strikes me when I look at this, although there are <laughs> many striking things here, is if you look at the way Jesus has his arm wrapped around Abba Menes' shoulders, to me it looks like Jesus' arm really stretches and wraps a long way. And sometimes I imagine that Jesus' arm stretches and wraps around my shoulders too. So I commend that to you. Is that Coptic? Yes, it is. Thank you. Is it Coptic? Yes. All right, elements of confession. I thought we could, um, that I would play a little bit with that phrase of, of what are we doing when we offer confession? You know, what is a prayer of confession really? What does it feel like? And so this is sort of a word scatter of what it feels like to offer confession. And then I put an and at the bottom so that you could add your own. Um, confession, offering what is in our heart to God, coming clean, <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, for me in the last six or nine months, I would say that confession has come to mean for me emotional honesty. And one of the things that I'm working on is um, learning to name my emotions with greater accuracy. And so what that's meant for me is um, doing a Google search for a feelings wheel and, uh, and looking at that and saying, okay, over a period of time, what are, what are the feelings that seem really present to me? And that's been part of confession is being honest with myself and being honest with God. Um, admitting our sin and shortcomings. I love the image of bringing what is hidden into God's light. I, I, I just love that. And you know, sometimes I even think of the image of, um, of having a well, like a water well, you drop the bucket in and then you pull the bucket up and you see what's in the bucket. Um, sometimes that's what confession feels like, is dropping the bucket into the well and seeing what comes up into the light telling the truth to myself, to God, and often to another person. Uh, one, of my, one of my personal practices of confession is that I'm in a small group that meets on Thursday, and one of our things that we do every week is we confess to each other. And so I'll tell you what that has done for me. It's done a couple of things for me. First of all, when I do something during the week, I know I'm gonna be sharing that at lunch on Thursday. <laughs> and um, and that, has, that has shaped me. That has shaped my spirituality. It has shaped my truth telling. It has also shaped the healing that's happened because I'm able to share that with another person. Um, the other thing that's done for me is it's revealed that I have, um, I have a pattern of sin. What I've realized by, by sharing, by confessing a sin on Thursdays every week with my friends, I start to see the same sins show up. I see this pattern, and that's really helped me. It's really helped me because what it says is, you know, if I say the same thing four, five, six, 12 weeks in a row, it helps me say, wow, God, God and I have some work to do here in this area. That's been, um, so telling the truth, you know, so simple, and then it can really take you down this fruitful road. Listening for God's invitation to action. Some of confession is not just confession, but often God will invite me to do something about what I have confessed. And often it is making amends with another person. And so I'll be confessing to God, oh, I had this encounter. I did this exchange. I said this smart aleck remark. I was sort of, I was careless with my words. I was unkind. Well, 
often by admitting that to God, there's an invitation to action that's part of that confession. Coming home to God, I am going to come back to this one, but confession feels to me like I am coming home to God. Bringing our burden to God. So a few weeks ago, I was sitting with a friend and I was confiding in her something that felt heavy in my life, something that I just had a hard time letting go. And it felt, as I was talking with my trusted friend, it felt very heavy. It felt like it wasn't ever going to go away. It felt like it was unsolvable. And what my friend did, my friend did the most beautiful thing. She reached out her hand like this towards me, and she said, I can't take that away from you, but I can help you hold it for a minute. And she said, God's the one, God is the one who can take that from you. But I can help you hold it for a minute. And it was a beautiful act of friendship. And it was a beautiful reminder that when we carry something inside that feels heavy, God is faithful to lift that heaviness for us, with us. So, um, and is there anything that you'd like to add into this elements of confession? I wanted to give you some space. You could, you can write it down on yours if you want to, or if there's something that you wanted to say out loud, you're welcome to do that too. The image that came to mind is removing the fig leaves. Removing the fig leaf. Bringing what is hidden makes me chuckle. That, you know, <laughs> he sees it already. Yes, God. Yeah, it's not like we're surprising God, right? <laughs> we're not, it's not like we're telling God something He doesn't already know, but revealing, allowing um, something that we think is hidden to become to come out and into the light. Thank you. All right, and I wanted to do a side by side of elements of confession and why we journal. A note on the difference between what I think is keeping a diary and journaling. You know, diary, you're recording things that happen, but journaling is moving into (coughs) your reflection on those events and encounters. And so the journaling is really about your reflection on that. Uh, Journaling is a place to explore your thoughts and your feelings. Uh, It's a place to record your prayers. I hear hear friends who are gifted in prayer, especially gifted in intercessory prayer, that they keep a journal of the people that they are praying for and the items that they are praying for, and then they leave a space for how those prayers are answered. And so that's become... (laughs) a valuable tool for them. Uh, Articulating our unique perspective. And I included this one, especially the word articulate our unique perspective is because there are so many wonderful writers and there are so many wonderful Facebook posts from inspirational speakers and poets and theologians and Um, and pastors and um, speakers. There's a lot of really good stuff out there. There's a lot of really beautiful words. And part of what I have learned is that there's something about finding your own words for things. Finding your words for things. C.S. Lewis says it this way. Well, how would I say that? Thomas Merton says it this way. How would I say that? Barbara Brown Taylor says it this way. How would I say that? And it helps me, even though, you know, my words are my words and their words are like, you know, writer's words, it still is powerful to find words for my own experience. All right. Um, Journaling helps us to process challenges and difficulties and a place to record our dreams and visions. And I mean both um, the gift of a nighttime dream where God communicates something to us while we're sleeping that God may not be able to communicate to us in the daytime when we're moving around and we're engaged in this active life. Um, Recording our dreams can also be a really 
powerful and potent part of journaling because we can then go back and revisit them. Um, especially, um, I have friends who work with dreams in such a way that someone may have a dream and then you may not understand it, but you've recorded it and then life happens and then not too long after, a few weeks, a few months, oh, my dream is connected to this thing in a way that we can't explain, but I'll say that that's part of God's mysterious way that he communicates with us. Why we journal, create space for grieving. Uh, I included this because in seasons of grief, personally, I found it very difficult to process times through times of grief. And I have had a couple of occasions where I postponed my grief. And, you know, grief postponed doesn't go anywhere. And journaling can be a safe way to process through times of extreme loss. And I wanted to make sure I included that. Journaling can be a place where we consider relationships, uh, how things are going, especially friendships, if we need to um, give some special attention to that. Journaling can be our place to respond to scripture, sermons, and other reading. And, and one, of the, one of the ways I do this, especially with sermons, is I'll sit in worship on Sunday morning, and I will listen, when I'm listening to the sermon or the message, what I'll listen for is, okay, what is that thing that's in this sermon that I need to carry into the next week? It may be a question. It may be um, an idea that's new or challenging. And so come Sunday evening, Monday morning, I may write across the top of my page that thing that stood out to me in the sermon or in a teaching. And then that becomes a place where I didn't just hear it and then move along to lunch. <clears throat> or I didn't just hear it, but then I give it a chance. It's kind of, I think this is how, when we hear a good teaching, a solid teaching, it's how that teaching gets woven into us. Because I think a lot of us, if we've been around for a while, we're like, okay, I've been at this for a while. Um, how can I go deeper? How can I continue to grow into the person that God made me to be? How can this sermon transform me and change me? I think journaling is really a way forward in that to where that thing that you heard, that teaching that you heard can become woven into your life. If you can carry it in, it helps it stay with you a little bit longer. In journaling, we listen for God's spirit. Also, um, especially in a time of discernment, if you're, if you're discerning uh, an important decision coming up, uh, we journal to track the movements and the activity of God in our lives because day to day we kind of whoosh, you know, <laughs> most of us live or a lot of us live 70 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour. And when we're living that quickly, we get this invitation from God to slow down and see what God's really doing. And a journal can be a place for us to do that. All right, we're at the and. So what and? Um, you can write that for yourself or if there's something that you would like to say out loud about the and part of journaling. I have a question. When uh, journaling, um, do you go back like the last week, the last month, and reread, and then what do you do if you've had, you know, 15 years of journals? Mm -hmm. how, how do you live life and, you know, can, do, you, do you revisit or do you, re, do you note dates that there was a particular impact that mm -hmm. you then can go back and cross-reference or? 
Well, I'll, I'll answer that. The question is, do I do I go back? How do I go back? When do I go back? Um, <clears throat> I don't go deep back, I don't go way back, um, but I have a smart friend, <laughs> to give it to my smart friend, on the front page of her, of her, of her journal, she, she makes a table of contents. And so as she, I know, right? I, I love having smart friends. So what she'll do is she'll say, you know, if she has a dream and she's trying to record her dream, she may say, you know, October 10th, dream, you know, donkey dream or, you know, whatever. Um, so that's, that's one way. And also, um, I guess just dating, you could go back for periods of your life. I don't go back more than about two years. Yeah just when I'm referencing. Um, I do have a, I had a journal three or four years ago and uh, I was in a group and we did, what are the desires of your heart? And so I journaled a list of what are the desires of my heart and I've gone back to that a number of times because to me that's a core, a core list that I wanna keep up with and revisit. Does that, does that help a little yes. bit? And also, um, I've also instructed um, a friend who knows where my journals are at home. So when I croak, mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, go home, get this box, and throw it away for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I've also put my safety measure in there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's look at a couple of passages on confession. Our first one is from the Gospel of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking, Matthew 23, 25 through 26. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first, clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Not calling us Pharisees, <laughs> but I think we get a wonderful key from Jesus here about confession. Confession is how we clean the inside of our cup and dish. You know, I'm wondering, like, what do we do with it? Okay, so I clean the inside of my cup and dish. I make my confession. Maybe I write it. Maybe I whisper it. Maybe I just see how it feels. And the invitation that I hear in here is for us to offer to God what is in our cup, what is in our heart. So our job there is offering it. And while I was doing this, I was imagining all the language through the Bible about cups. The cup of mercy, the cup of suffering, the cup of Christ, the cup where Jesus says, if this cup can pass from me. It was a really rich image for me as I, um, as I, sp I just spent time with this passage. So I, I commend that to you. Um, just that image of, of cleaning, of cleansing the inside. And then from Luke, we're going to pick up in the middle of the story. We're picking up in the middle of the prodigal son. And the prodigal has, um, the father has two sons. The son goes to the father and asks for his inheritance. He sets out. He squanders his inheritance. He ends up working and feeding pigs. And he comes to himself. It says he comes to himself. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, while he was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This is my favorite story for confession. Hands down, this is, my, this is my favorite passage. There are other passages that speak directly to confession, that give us instructions for confession, but I just, I, I'm, I'm in love with this story. And I'm in love with this compassionate father. And there's some translations of the Bible that instead of calling this story uh, the story of the prodigal son or the parable of the prodigal son, they call it the parable of the compassionate father. They rename it. What I notice here is that the father's response is not just words, but action. I really, I love that. And then um, the three areas or the three things that are given to this son, the robe representing mercy, provision, the ring representing authority and responsibility, and then the sandals representing you're a son, you're not a slave. And what gets restored is the son's sense of belovedness. He's the beloved son. And this is the story of what happens to us. This is our story right here. We get up and we go to the Father. We get up and make our confession to God. Even when we're a long way off, God sees us. Even when we're a long way off. And He's filled with compassion. Now, that's a pretty simple thing to say. But when I mess up, when I sin, when I have my shortcomings, it takes a pretty big step for me to remember that God is filled with compassion because I'm filled with a lot of other things. I'm filled with self-condemnation. I'm filled with shame. I'm filled with self-judgment. I can give myself a really hard time and that's not how God meets me. It's not how God meets you. God meets you filled with compassion. God sees you from a long way off and he meets you with compassion and he runs towards you. You know, when we want to like, we want to kind of like do this thing right here. <laughs> we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. My friend Katie shared with me how she, how she prays this passage. <clears throat> And what, she, she's not a morning person, she's a night person. Amen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good, I'm so glad. Um, so my friend Katie, who is a night person, she makes her prayer time at night. So around 10 o'clock at night, she imagines that she's coming up that road to God. She imagines every night that she's coming home to God. And as she's um, doing her journal or doing her reading, she, she makes her prayer that she comes home to God every night. What a, what a way to end your day. What a day to enter your rest, knowing that you've come home to God. And that's something that you can do every night. I, I love that. I, I love that she shared that with me. Our painting is by Kay Redman, and this is her rendition of the prodigal son. Not the most famous prodigal son painting, 
but I, um, I am really drawn to everything in this image. The open eyes of the compassionate father, the way that they lean in towards each other, Calf doesn't look all too pleased. Mm -hmm. I know. He's yeah. like, oh Lord, what's getting ready to happen here? <laughs> He's giving a little side eye. Yeah. <laughs> and the brother. Yep, there's the brother still out in the field. So there's a lot here. There's a lot here to work with. Yeah. There's also a bird coming down. There sure is. Might be the Holy That's Spirit. right, our Holy Spirit dove up there in the left hand corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even more than, um, even more than this being uh, a wonderful painting, um, I've actually made a prayer card out of it uh, that I use at home. And sometimes I'll just sit with this card, and my eyes will travel around the card, and and that will spark a prayer in me. Who am I today? Yeah. Who am I? Am I am I the older brother out here working my tail off? Am I the, um, you know, there may be a day where I feel like the cow. <laughs> the thing about this parable is, who am I this minute? But yeah. yeah. Who am I this day? Who am I this minute? Um, and and can I um, can I continue to grow towards being that compassionate father? So. All right, I, I just wanted to pause, make another pause here um, to see what connections you're making, a comment that you have, a reflection that you're having. You know, something I was thinking about that I don't think I'd actually put two and two together is it, I, I had this kind of revolution in my prayer life several years back that prayer was not just me informing God about things and prayer was not just God like me changing my heart but prayer actually God did something through the prayer which is why we, we have to pray and I don't think I'd ever thought of confession that way that we have to confess like, it's not that we have to tell God what we send so that he knows but if we don't confess something doesn't happen yeah Right? Like yeah. something actually happens through the confession that allows change to take place that doesn't get to happen if, if we don't make that confession. And I, I don't think I'd, I, I, I don't think I'd really thought about it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Something happens when we confess. It's not that God doesn't already know. That we can, that confession can be a formational. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we're going to move into uh, a spiritual practice. We're going to learn a little bit from Ignatius of Loyola and the examine of consciousness. Boy, that's a sentence, isn't it? All right, Ignatius of Loyola lived in 16th century in the Basque region of Spain. He lived in a time where he was very interested in chivalry culture courtly love. He was a, uh, he was a romantic. He also was a celebrated soldier. He was in the military. And there was a lot of um, battles that happened within Spain and also battles that happened between Spain and France at that time. And it was in a battle um, between Spain and France that he was hit with a cannonball in the leg and was severely wounded had a very long recovery, a long, extensive, painful recovery. And sometime in whatever that version of hospital was, and then later he was home. And the only thing he had to read during that time were uh, the lives of saints and the Bible. And so during that time, he had a... Um, a religious conversion 
and he became interested in his own transformation, becoming a, a man of God. He founded the Jesuit order, so our, our Jesuit friends, um, the Society of Jesus. And then his landmark book, his landmark book is The Spiritual Exercises. And they were, that book was really, or those exercises were really an innovation of that time. And they're designed to get closer to God, to form Christ in you. And there are people now, you can still, it takes a long, it's a, it's, it takes a long time, but you can still go through the Ignatian exercises. And for some people that becomes part of their, um, that just becomes part of their faith, part of their spirituality is to go through the Ignatian exercises. And so I just wanted to kind of, that's a very light, um, broad brush stroke introduction to Ignatius. Uh, there's lots of wonderful material out there on him. That So if that kind of piques your interest, you can follow that trail and it'll lead you to some really good places. One of the things that I really love about the way Ignatius um, interacts with scripture is to read a passage in the Ignatian way means to step into that passage and use your five senses. So it would be if we worked with that parable of the prodigal son, what am I seeing? What am I touching? What am I smelling? What am I hearing? It's as much as possible putting yourself in that encounter. And then we've mentioned too, who am I in this encounter? Where am I? Am I close up, part of the action? Am I one of the people? Or am I like the moon? <laughs> you know, am I watching it from a distance? So. That's, um, that's something to love about Ignatius. Here's, his other, here's another contribution, and this is the one that, um, that partners, that goes with both confession and journaling, is his examine of consciousness. And this portion, um, I borrowed and adapted from a devotional written by um, my mentor, Dr. Jerry Weber. And so I, I, it, it's so well put together here that I just wanted to bring it to you. And rather than, <coughs> rather than write this tonight, which if you were at home, you would write it, I thought we would just do it together, where we're just sitting together. And I'll, I'll walk you through this examine, and then, um, and then when you're at home, you can do it by the written way. So, uh, Okay, are y'all game for that? <laughs> Surprise, we're doing a thing, okay. <laughs> All right, so, um, and, and I realize we're kind of at the end of the day, so I'll try not to make it where, you know, I send you off into, you know, where you're just gonna have to lay your head on the table for the, <laughs> the rest of our time together. All right, so if you would, um, I can see you're already sitting comfortably, but if you need to make an adjustment, you know, if you need to like resituate yourself in your chair, um, and if you would like to lightly close your eyes, if you'd like to, you can. You don't even have to follow along with your words. You can close your eyes. You can put your hands down, and um, and we'll just enter this time together. <clears throat> We'll begin by considering the last 24 hours or so. So since about 7.30 last night, do a rewind of your day. And in the last day, in the last 24 hours, when did you give love? When did you show love? What experience did you have that felt energizing, that felt purposeful? When did you most feel like yourself?
And over the last day, when would you say you were most aware of God's presence? I know God's with me. When was that? When did you feel like you were in alignment with God's movement through the world? And what gift or what gifts did you receive from God over the last day? What felt like a gift from God? And now, how would you like to offer thanks? How would you like to say, thank you, Lord, for all that I've experienced in the last day? And we keep considering the last 24 hours the last day or so, and when did we feel the absence of love? When did you feel that life and love and energy just drained out of you? What moment, in what moment did you feel least like yourself? I didn't feel like myself when this was happening. Is there something you're sorry for? Mm. Was there a moment when it felt like you were moving against the flow of God and God's purposes for the world? Maybe out of sync with spirit. And when was it you were unaware or you just didn't notice God at some point during the day? And now we ask God for healing, for courage. Mending. Oh Lord, you are with us in all of our days. In the moments we feel alive and energized and close to you and loving and you're with us in the moments that make us feel sorry, in the moments that feel empty or painful. We wonder where you are and you bring us healing in those moments, for those moments. It is the gift of your son Jesus. The Ignatian words for this, consolation and desolation. And both are true and real and necessary. 
and I find when we ponder the desolation, it's so important to remember the consolation because there are both every single day. Thank you for going there. God meets us there. God meets us there and reminds us that we are connected to God with a connection that can't ever be broken. We're connected to God with a cord, with a thread that cannot be cut. It can be tangled up, but it can't be cut or broken. And we have that assurance. And sometimes when I do this at home, um, I'll put my hand on my heart. You know, when I have a hard time focusing or when I'm distracted um, or I have a hard time going there, I put my hand on my heart. It helps me get there. Um, so I, I commend this to you as, as a practice. Um, a couple of the books that got passed around, one of them is the um, Sleeping with Bread, the Matthew, Matthew Dennison, Sheila Lynn book. Um, Sleeping with Bread is their book where they explore more fully the examine. Also, I love them because they're um, short, simple, illustrated, and so I find them very accessible. So that's the Sleeping with Bread, and his children's or their children's book is Making Heart Bread. So if you have children in your life, um, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, neighbors, um, I commend that book to you um, because it helps children with the examine. And part of our family life growing up, the way that we sort of worked this with um, <coughs> at home when we gathered for a meal at home is, what was the happy part of your day? What was the sad part of your day or the hard part of the day? And um, that helped us as a, as a family. And even, you know, now I'm an empty nester now, so, um, my, my husband and I will do that from time to time. Hey, what was really great about today? Or what was really hard about today? Just as a way of um, is being community with each other. Uh, a couple of other things about, good. A couple of other things about the examine is we did this for one day. Now, there are times, like especially Sabbath, if I'm kind of marking a Sabbath day, I'll do it for the week. I'll say, okay, over the last week, where is this? Or if I go on retreat, I may say, over the last three months, over the last six months, over the last year. And the benefit of um, examine for me in that way is I get to see patterns. I get to notice patterns. Okay, when, when is my, um, my feeling of consolation? Uh, when I'm connected with people that I love, and friends that sort of get me, man, that's it. So what do I do if I notice that that's a pattern, if I start seeing a pattern, that means I need to make more time and space for that. If I see, gosh, I really didn't wanna go do this thing I felt like I had to go do, and that sort of repeats, that tells me that I perhaps should not do that as often. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do have to like, I'll, I'll do a quick rabbit trail. There was a time when I was a mom with young kids, and I'm like, I told my, I told my pastor, I'm like, so what if parenting is on my desolation list all the time? <laughs> yeah, it's not like I can do less of that. And so my wise pastor said, perhaps you could do it in a different way. Maybe you need to learn how to do this part. Try some new ways of doing that. So, yeah. We used to joke we would sell the kids on eBay, but we did not. So. <laughs> um, the other time that I have, um, the other time I've worked with an examine that was really fruitful is when my husband and I celebrated our 20-year anniversary. We took a anniversary weekend, and we did the examine for our marriage. And so I sent him off, and I went off, and I and and I said, okay. Over the last 20 years, what have been 
when we felt closest to God, when we felt in sync, when we felt like things were really good marriage-wise, just you and I. And so we did that. And then we also did the times when, when was it really hard? Like when was our, what were our obstacles? And then we got together, we spent some time separately and then we got together and we shared our list. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was a real bonding moment for us to reflect to spend that time reflecting and say, wow, look at all, all the ways that God has been um, with us in the last 20 years. Look at all the things that we have experienced together over the last 20 years and to give thanks for that and to ask for healing for that. So there's a lot of ways that the examine can be part of what you do. All right, couple of, I wanted to include a couple of prayers just as sometimes it's helpful to um did you have a question or no okay um (laughs) sorry um sometimes i find it helpful to sort of prime the pump with a prayer that already exists like okay i get it i think i'll try confession in my journal but now i don't know what to do uh i mean which i i've been there which is why i included these Uh, The first one is from the Book of Common Prayer, and we'll recognize it, uh, a lot of this language from our, um, the prayer that we say when we're consecrating communion when we gather for the Lord's Supper. Uh, Most most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. So this is a very inclusive prayer of confession. And there are lots of stopping points here. You don't have to hurry up and pray this. And there may be on a particular time that you may pray it, there may be something that especially stands out to you as, oh, this is where I need to just, I need to, I need to stop here for a minute. I need to stop here for a minute and, and there's more here. I, uh, I met uh, an Episcopal priest earlier this fall and, and we were talking about liturgy and do we have any um, Episcopals? Like I grew up Episcopal or I've worshiped at an Episcopal church. Okay, so one of the things that this priest taught us about their liturgy is that when the people offer their confession, the priest offers words of comfort, that that's part of the liturgy. And I was really excited by that. I thought, because that's exactly what we need when we have confessed is the words of comfort. And I think in the Methodist, in our Methodist circles, they may be words of pardon, words of assurance. And, but I I did love that the Episcopals say comfort, just straight up comfort, because yes, appreciate that. This, uh, This next prayer is attributed to Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scots. And I just return to it all the time. It also some really beautiful stopping points for us. Keep us, O Lord, from all pettiness. Let us be large in thought, in word, and in deed. Let us be done with fault finding and leave off all self-seeking. May we put away all pretense and meet each other face to face without self-pity and without prejudice. May we never be hasty in judgment and always generous. Let us take time for all things. Make us grow calm, serene and gentle. Teach us to put our action teach us to put into action our better impulses, straightforward and unafraid. Grant that we may realize that is it is the little things of life that create differences that in the big things of life we are as one. And, O oh Lord God, let us not forget to be kind. Amen. It's really beautiful. It's so beautiful. And I find that this leads me to confession. I don't even have to get past the first line. Lord, keep us from all pettiness. 
That's going to lead me right. That'll lead me right into confession. I may not even make it to the. Yeah. <laughs> Let us be large in thought. Yes, because I get in trouble when I get small. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, I, I'm so happy that I have just a moment for, I have down at the bottom of the last page, first of all, I've noted the books down there for you. Um, <clears throat> the books, I, I said something about sleeping with bread. I said something about making heart bread. Sacred Space, um, the prayer book, uh, that is a Jesuit prayer book. That's the one that I use every day. They have a beautiful outline that moves you through prayer and includes um, a section that would allow for um, confession. And then this openings book, um, before Casey invited me to come, one of the things that I really, I really like about that openings book is that it has a prayer practice that, and the prayer practice around January, February was journaling. So I was like, wow, that's not a coincidence. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so anyway, I really appreciated that. And this last one, Psalms for Praying, we prayed that Psalm 51. That's where that came from. This bonus content from Madeline Lee Engel. I couldn't resist bringing this to y'all because often when I confess, it has to do with difficult people in my life. <laughs> it just does. I can't tell you how often I'll end up because I just, sometimes I just don't know how to be. I just don't know how to be sometimes. And I, you know, and, and so my confession will end up with, I just don't know. I, Lord, I don't know. I don't know. And so this, this little piece from Madeline Lee Engel, it makes me smile, but it's also, I put this one into works. Here's what she says. We must bless without wanting to manipulate, without insisting that everything be straightened out right now, without insisting that our truth be known. This means simply turning whoever it is we need to bless over to God, knowing that God's powerful love will do what our own feeble love or lack of it won't. I have suggested that it is a good practice to believe in six impossible things every morning before breakfast, like the white queen in Through the Looking Glass. It is also salutary to bless six people I don't much like every morning before breakfast. <laughs> I read this and I decided to put this one into practice with my journaling. And from time to time, and now I, I did do it quite regularly when I first read this, and now I do it from time to time. I will list six people and I will write a blessing for them. And if I'm having a hard time with somebody, you know, I mean, it is, it's a, it's a very practical way to bless your enemies or bless those that you perceive as your enemies. And, you know, bless Lori, bless her that she would know the truth about herself, bless her that she would know that she is your beloved, bless her that she would lead well in this capacity. And so what I found, I had one difficult person while I was really working this, and I'm telling you that I blessed her every day for 10 months before I felt that loosen in me. And it did, but it's the regular blessing. And what would I do? I would get frustrated and, and I would get frustrated, but then I'd say, well, gosh, you know, like, well, I don't know why I'm getting frustrated because I'm just going to get up and bless her tomorrow morning. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> but it did something in me. Blessing somebody that I considered an enemy did something in me and, and God worked that. And so even though this is sort of a little lighthearted thing, um, I'm telling you, if you kind of struggle with difficult people, it's, gosh, it's just something you can do. You know, and sometimes we just need that one little thing to do. Well, um, thank you, and thank you for having me, and um, thank you for, um, I just appreciate the warmth that you have been sending my way um, as I have been standing here. And um, if, if you have any uh, comments or questions, um, before we close out, I wanted to open up for that.
I just want to thank you for that exam that we did all together about consciousness. Mm -hmm. it, it brought me to tears today. It made me conscious of all the things that I did and that I didn't do. That's very, I'll, I'll keep doing that. Thank you. Grateful. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Meredith, would you like to close us yes. out? Okay. Thank you so much. Let's, let's close out in prayer. God, we are so, so grateful. We're grateful for this evening. We're grateful for Lori's willingness to come and share with us. And we're grateful for this extraordinary offer that you've made us that every time we come to you in confession, you run toward us and greet us and pull us back into an embrace. And so, God, as we go on to this evening, go with us. Pull us into your arms. Keep us ever close to your spirit and your heart tonight that we might know in our soul of souls that we are never alone. This we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you guys. We'll see you next week.